So how exactly does somebody learn to love theology? How exactly did I learn to love theology? What sparked my interest in it? Well, today I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. Let's go ahead and get started. So hello everybody and welcome back to Grace Nerd. My name is Eric if you're new to the channel. If you enjoy talking about Christian theology or you like commentary on culture from a Christian worldview or you like to simply listen to talk about the Christian life then make sure that you go ahead and subscribe and hit the notification bell here on YouTube that way you'll know when new episodes get uploaded. Or if you've discovered the podcast in audio form make sure that you go ahead and subscribe on whatever platform you found it. So in this episode I'm actually going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to share actually an old Old video with you that I made on my gaming channel a few years ago. I made it before that channel had as much focus on gaming as it does now and it was long before I decided to split off a second channel where I could focus exclusively on theology. So I think that the video that I'm going to share with you actually is far better suited here and it only received a couple hundred views over the course of the years on the other channel. So in this video I share some of my story as to how I began to pursue theology in the academic world and what conflict conflicts took place in my life and in my heart that caused it to be such an important issue for me that Christians grow to love and have a passion for a deeper understanding of theology. So throughout the course of this video, I think you'll see a little bit of overlap, particularly if you watched my recent video on defending the doctrine of the atonement. In that video, I touched on a little bit of the teachings of Rob Bell. So you're going to see some of that same content covered in this video because that was an issue that I tackled back in the day and it was something that influenced my thoughts now because I was forced to wrestle with that issue and come to conclusions on it for myself. I think you'll find that many of the issues that I'm passionate about on this channel today really were birthed out of the conflict that I experienced back in the day. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this old video called Learning to Love Theology. Let's go ahead and get started on it. Looking back, my memories of growing up mainly take place in charismatic churches. I know my audience is mixed, so that will strike different viewers in different ways. Those not familiar with Christianity or church denominations might not make much of it. Those who know me well will not be surprised since they know my story. Those who are familiar with my current convictions regarding Reformed theology or the doctrines of grace, but who don't know much else about me, might be shocked. For those who don't know what a charismatic or a Pentecostal church is, it is a church that believes that, included in the continuing work of the Holy Spirit, are things like supernatural healings or revelatory gifts. These revelatory gifts include prophetic words and speaking in tongues. Regardless of how you feel about Pentecostalism or charismatic teaching, this is the tradition where I came to know Christ. I came to know the true gospel of Christ's death in my place. I learned about substitutionary atonement, the new birth, repentance, and forgiveness of sin. For as long as I can remember calling myself a Christian, I have always held to the belief in the centrality of grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For those who have heard weird things about charismatic churches and think they're breeding grounds for heresy, anti-intellectualism, and prosperity teaching, well, my view of such things is complicated. I absolutely came to know Christ in this movement. Those whose teachings I have sat under in these churches would absolutely affirm the gospel as I just stated it. Therefore, to this day I consider the charismatic movement to be a part of Orthodox Christianity, though there are certainly very notable fringe elements. In fact, though I no longer belong to a classically Pentecostal denomination, strictly speaking, I have chosen to plant myself in a church that believes in the continuation of supernatural and even revelatory gifts, though it also puts a high priority on the centrality of scripture and teaches the gospel and the doctrines of grace consistently, I don't dispute most of the charges laid against the charismatic movement. I have seen spiritual abuses. I've seen the means by which prosperity teaching can sneak into the pulpit. I once went to a Benny Hinn crusade and watched him supposedly throw the Holy Spirit around like a football and bring people up on stage to talk about the healings they had just experienced during the event. Sure enough, I later found out that at least one of the men who came up on stage and showed off his now unneeded back brace was someone who had traveled with Benny Hinn and spoke of his healing at each event as if it had just happened. Meanwhile, a woman from our church was busy rolling her paralyzed husband back to her van with no change at all, 
Her husband eventually died without experiencing supernatural healing. I have also experienced anti-intellectualism and a resistance to systematic forms of theological study. This problem is real. It has been my struggle to find balance in this area, among others, that inspired this video. My journey toward a love of theology, as I experience it now, was a complicated one. After high school, I chose to go to a small, charismatic Bible school my parents had connected with, but it initially was not out of a longing for academic theological pursuits. It was a combination of fulfilling my parents' wishes and a belief that I didn't have much chance of succeeding elsewhere. However, I did eventually come to grow in confidence in my academic ability. I also came to enjoy the theological studies to a large extent. I recall multiple professors and their insights with great fondness. That said, my fascination with theology in those days was often short-lived, and the facts and ideas I learned and pondered were limited to the time frame of the classes in which they were taught. God has interesting ways of putting us on the right track, and sometimes he lets us stumble around in the darkness for a while so we can better see the light. Allow me to tell a more specific portion of my story to show what I'm talking about. The purpose of it will become clear. In the midst of my time in Bible school, my classmates and I became familiar with a pastor named Rob Bell. Many of you have heard of him. He made really cool videos with catchy names and thought-provoking ideas. It got to a point where students would exegete his videos for sermons more than they would exegete scripture. I quoted him with great admiration in one of my own later writing projects after graduation, before transferring to finish my undergraduate work. I listened to commentators and church leaders who criticized Bell and I would feel irritated. They talked about terms like neo-orthodoxy, theological liberalism, and postmodernism, and applied them to Bell and his movement. I would tell myself that they just didn't understand the vision Bell had when it came to attracting the next generation and fighting unnecessary stumbling blocks seekers might have in coming to church. I scoffed when one Christian show I listened to predicted that Bell would, in five years time or so, likely reject traditional Christian views on sexuality. I heard this around 2009, I believe. His popularity continued, as well as the popularity of the movement he was often associated with, the emergent church. The movement included many other individuals, one of which was Brian McLaren. Before I begin to criticize Rob Bell, I should speak to those who have previously been offended by conservative Christian views on sexuality. Nothing I want to bring up is spoken out of hatred or so-called bigotry. While I hold to a traditional Christian view on the sinful nature of homosexuality, I believe that every single human, including me, is fallen in all areas of life. That includes heterosexuals. Granted, when a homosexual seriously contemplates the claims of Christianity for themselves in regard to what God affirms as holy, they will be challenged in a far more fundamental way. I do not envy that struggle, especially when they live in a culture that screams to them that their sexual desires are definitional to their identity. I will simply say that I truly believe God's promises to help those who put their faith in Him are utterly trustworthy, and He calls His people to embrace anyone who seeks to leave their old life behind no matter what kind of temptation their old life offers them. I began to have suspicions about the movement as I transferred to the school where I would finish my undergraduate work. However, I was unable to work up the courage to condemn the movement outright. It was at that point that I decided to pick up a book that a professor from my previous school recommended called Why We're Not Emergent by Kevin DeYoung and Ted Kluck. I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that this book shifted the course of my entire theological thought life. It was careful, precise, and gracious even in its strong declarations. Yet it was also a devastating exposure of the theological roots of the emergent church movement. While the subject matter is now dated, and the emergent church is not even a term commonly used anymore, there are principles of discernment in the book that I would hope every Christian would care to learn. Sure enough, not long after I consciously removed myself from the influence of the emergent church. Rob Bell and Brian McLaren released books almost simultaneously that confirmed everyone's fears. Brian McLaren released A New Kind of Christianity, which undercut countless historical Christian truths. He rejected the historicity of the Old Testament and replaced it with a view that it was merely a snapshot of the immature beliefs of the people of God at that time. He rejected biblical views of sexuality he rejected orthodox views of heaven, hell, 
and the exclusivity of Christ. In Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, Bell completely redefines the Bible's teaching on heaven and hell in order to represent something more palatable. And then there is the question behind the questions, the real question, what is God like? Because millions and millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus, is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God? How could that God ever be good? How could that God ever be trusted? And how could that ever be good news? This is why lots of people want nothing to do with the Christian faith. They see it as an endless list of absurdities and inconsistencies, and they say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? And sure enough, in 2013, he fully abandoned traditional biblical teachings on sexuality. I think it's great that you all made a conscious choice to include gay marriage in here. Absolutely. Yeah. Why? Because one of the oldest aches in the bones of humanity is loneliness. I mean, it's one of the things that goes way, way back. Loneliness is not good for the world. And so whoever you are, gay or straight, it is totally normal, natural, and healthy to want somebody to go through life with. It's, it's central to our humanity. Yeah. We want someone to go on the journey with. When is the church going to get that? Even sooner than the prediction I mentioned before, when reasonably challenged about this by one of his friends, Andrew Wilson, on Unbelievable Radio, Rob Bell did not exactly respond graciously. Is that it then? Do we just like part ways? Or do you take the bread and wine and does Christ hold us together? Is there something that trumps whatever differences we have? Like that's the question. Like literally you're asking, and this is part of like sort of the bull that really, really, really pushes people away is when you have a particular conviction and all of a sudden your orthodoxy or your faithfulness to Jesus is all of a sudden called into question. Mm. After experiencing all of this, I was forced to examine the ways by which I should come to embrace or reject different teachings. I had to come to a realization. It was not leaders in my current denomination who had expressed any interest or willingness to refute movements like the one I had just escaped. If anything, it came to a point where I was warning them about certain trends in the church. Sometimes they lent their ear, sometimes they didn't. So who were these leaders who so clearly saw this movement for what it was, even before its more pernicious elements came to light? Some of the names that I ran across as I tried to educate myself were John Piper, D.A. Carson, and as mentioned before, Kevin DeYoung. While there are plenty of differences among them, they held certain truths in common across the board. They had an uncompromising commitment to the centrality of Scripture as our sole infallible authority. It was the book that settled disputes when rightly handled. It was not to be demeaned as a merely human creation that could be accused of causing disputes. Humans cause disputes, not the Word of God. All of them held to the centrality of the gospel, the gospel that I always embraced at the deepest level, even when I was giving deeply mistaken teachers the benefit of the doubt. What was new to me was their common belief in what are often called the doctrines of grace. In short, they all held to a very high view of God's sovereign providential rule, both over creation as well as over salvation itself. While my discovery of their teaching did not immediately convert me to their core tenets, it forced me to have more serious conversations with the friends I had made in college, friends who in fact had already embraced this high view of God's sovereignty. I was beginning to embrace theological curiosity without any requirement to do so from the school I was attending. In short, my being burnt and nearly led astray by a false movement actually turned out to be God's providential means of causing me to pursue and love the study of theology more than ever before. Conflict had become a driving force towards sound thinking for me, much like it did for the early church. After I finished my undergraduate work, I had the opportunity to visit Bosnia-Herzegovina. I had done a year and a half of missionary work there with my family from 2002 to 2003, and now that it was January of 2011, 
I was happy to join my dad on another trip there for a couple of months. While I was there, I was able to help set up a publishing office for him, as well as take something of a vacation since I had just graduated. Inevitably, I began to go on the internet and revisit old arguments I had engaged in with friends at school. I needed to know what I thought about such divisive issues as election and predestination. This is where I finally encountered John Piper in full force. Again, I intellectually was not fully convinced of what is often called the five points of Calvinism. I remained unconvinced even while listening to Piper's series on it. But something else happened as I began listening. There was a moment where Piper described how he thought about his faith, and it resonated with me so deeply that I suddenly felt that I was given permission to use my mind in unison with my spirit. My mind felt respected in a way that, up until that point, I felt was frowned upon by those in my Christian tradition. I didn't always believe what I do today about what the Bible teaches concerning the sovereignty of God in our salvation. My home growing up was um, an evangelistic home in which my dad loved the sovereignty of God and loved the glory of God and manifestly prayed it and manifestly lived it. He didn't articulate it much to me. We didn't talk much theology growing up. My father was not a theologian in the sense of being an analytical thinker who faces problems and then solves them. He was a proclaimer of biblical gospel. He was an evangelist. It's the way he was put together and that was his calling. And, and uh, I'm very different from my dad <coughs> in that regard, in that I see problems everywhere. I'm just wired to see problems and I devote most of my life to trying to solve them or cope with them because I can't not see them and I've worked in fact relatively hard in the last 30 years to cultivate that skill because I think John Dewey was right when he said nobody begins to think until they see a problem when you see a problem your your mind comes into gear and you start working on it but if, if you don't see any problems your mind gen generally stays in neutral and you don't apply your mind to make sense out of anything it's when you bump into apparent contradictions or puzzling things in nature or puzzling things in people or puzzling things in the Bible that your your mind starts to ask questions and put things together and formulate hypotheses and rule out options and and thinking happens as I began to talk about these theological issues with missionaries and other workers on the trip, the presence of this stigma was confirmed for me. One missionary tried to encourage me by saying that eventually I would settle down and realize that all these issues simply weren't important. In other words, it seemed unavoidable to understand him as saying that a sign of maturity as a Christian was that you no longer felt the need to pursue theological understanding. In a separate conversation, I felt as if he had something of a Freudian slip. He pointed out the fact that many in the church we were helping did not have Bibles. However, he did not speak of this in a strictly negative way. He was pointing out that this allowed people to think much more simply about their faith than just focus on Jesus, rather than getting into disputes caused by more intense biblical study. It wasn't even that he was saying he disagreed with the perspectives I was considering. He thought the entire pursuit itself was a waste of time. Sentiments similar to this were expressed when missionaries from a very prominent American charismatic church came to minister during a short-term visit. In one sermon, one of the missionaries talked about the essential truths we agree on versus theology. He spoke of theology in a degrading way and described it merely as my opinion versus your opinion and something that would only lead to useless division. At this point, my feeling of marginalization was complete. I should say right now that my goal, at least in this video, isn't necessarily to win everyone over to my exact theological perspectives, as much as I am thrilled to see when people embrace what I consider to be the truth. I simply want to show the context and theological topics God seemed to use to open my mind to pursuing him more holistically. Still, this might be a good time to mention a quote from Douglas Wilson's book The Serrated Edge that tackles this issue of believing oneself to be right 
I always believe that I am right. This is not the same thing as believing that I am always right. I know that I have often been wrong. Nevertheless, I, along with everyone else in the world, always believe, at the time the view is maintained, that I am right. No one ever said that he was convinced that thus and such was the case, but that he was not convinced that it was the case. So when someone comes to rebuke me for always thinking I am right, is he coming with this rebuke because he thinks he is wrong about it? This problem of arrogance arises whenever we refuse to bring our views to the bar of scripture to be corrected there. And if we are willing to be corrected there, it does not matter what the world thinks about it. Though we do not know everything there is to know, and though we do not know anything perfectly, yet we do know many things truly and confidently because of God's revelation and His Spirit. Before I give you a couple of examples, I'm, I'm reacting here today to the postmodern skepticism of the ability to know anything and the accusation that if you presume to say you know something, you're arrogant. Um, let me give you a take on that arrogance piece. I think the opposite is the case. That is, a person who says, I believe there is objective reality here, propositional truth that two minds looking at can see and understand and decide to submit to or not. I think that's what's here. If you say, I think that's arrogant to presume that you can see what's here, claim that you see it, and then tell another person they're wrong because they're not seeing it. I think that's arrogant. Contemplate the alternative. The alternative would be that this either doesn't offer objective, concrete, propositional reality, or you can't really know it and have access to it, then what's left for you to do? What's left for you to do is what you jolly well please. Moving on, later in the year when I was back in America, and as summer was beginning, I chose to pursue ideas of Calvinism and predestination even further. If memory serves, it was at this point that I picked up a much older book that John Piper had recommended in his Tulip series, namely, Jonathan Edwards' The Freedom of the Will. For those of you who may not know, Jonathan Edwards was one of the heroes of the Great Awakening during the 18th century. Freedom of the Will was one of the most philosophically dense and difficult books I have ever read. However, when I was finished with it, I felt that I had come to a watershed moment. While Piper had left me inspired to passionately pursue God with my mind, I was still unconvinced of his perspectives philosophically, and though I knew his interpretations of scripture and defenses of his perspectives in large part, I did not ultimately buy into them. However, Jonathan Edwards, to put it bluntly, beat me into intellectual submission like many others who had come before me. He not only convinced me of these tenets of Reformed theology, but he made me feel a great joy in embracing them. In his words, absolute sovereignty is what I love to ascribe to God. I went from saying, well, these Calvinists would argue such and such, to I am arguing such and such. Contrary to the opinion of many, these doctrines did not become my gospel, but they took the gospel I already held and gave it an unmoving and intellectually consistent foundation. As you can see, I've largely avoided digging into the details of this theological system since it's not precisely my main point here, but if you're curious about it, follow my weekly theology class or click on the link to my book Simply Sovereign in the description below. Unfortunately, this caused me to enter what many have come to call the cage stage of Calvinism. In church, with my friends, nearly every Bible study question had to be about these difficult theological topics. I believe I largely wanted others to experience the same joy I had in thinking on theology in general, and about these topics specifically, but there is no question that pride and a desire to merely prove myself wise and correct 
crept in at times. When I eventually was told that small group gatherings were not a place for such topics, but were merely a time for practical life discussion, I knew that I had become detached from my current church culture in a nearly irreparable way. I could no longer embrace any hint of an idea that theology could be separated from practical life. Right doctrine honors God and blesses people. Wrong doctrine dishonors God and hurts people. Sometimes people play off love against theology, doing doctrine and say, don't spend time defending the gospel or arguing for true doctrine because it's not loving. What people need is relationships and loving. And, and my answer to that is, is indeed they do, and they're not mutually exclusive. But if these things go wrong, the foundations for these relationships collapse. It was the pursuit of theology that had restored a joy in the gospel for me in a way I hadn't experienced since the day of my salvation. How we think about God informs how we feel about God, how we worship God, and inevitably, every aspect of how we live. I remain in good relationship with the church I am describing, but I eventually did join a church in the X-29 network. Up to this point, the church I am in has struck a good balance between mind, heart, and spirit. I am currently in a place where I can grow, continually hear what I believe to be a biblically grounded gospel, and I have been given opportunity to teach it to others. As you can see, this has largely been an autobiographical video, but hopefully I have painted a picture of what I believe God does in the lives of many of his people to cause them to apply all of their life to their faith, including their mind. Conflict and problems are never fun things to be around. But I agree with John Piper's quote when he pointed out that we do not truly begin to think until we see a problem. There is a way to disagree agreeably with our brothers and sisters in order that we may grow. But if we try to avoid conflict by making the essentials of our faith as narrow as possible in order to avoid as many unnecessary discussions as possible, the enemy has a way of making the realm of essentials as small as possible. This is what leads to emergent church movements and the like. So I hope I have communicated to you both the joy of and the need for deep theological study. While not everyone is called to be a theologian in the sense of being an academic, all of us are theologians in that we are called to think rightly about God. So make every effort to be a biblical theologian. So there you have it, folks. There's a little bit of my story. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that it helped you to understand me a little bit more and helped you understand why theology is such an important topic for everyday Christians. If you found this video helpful, make sure that you leave a like. And again, if you're new to the channel, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell. Or if you discovered the podcast in audio form, make sure that you subscribe wherever you are. If you'd like to contribute to my work on a monthly basis, then check out my Subscribestar page. Perhaps you'll be able to help me get one step closer to the long distance vision of doing online content full time. That's a long way off, but again, feel free to check it out if you'd like to help me pursue it. So until next time, my name's Eric. This is Grace Nerd. Thanks for stopping by.